any resident of the school district of Holman is eligible to serve in that role, I would um, entertain a motion for meeting chairperson. I would nominate um, Cheryl Hancock. A second. Are there any other nominations for meeting chairperson? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Seeing none, there is a motion and a second to approve Cheryl Hancock as the meeting chairperson. And I would remind the audience that you're invited to vote along with us, all district res residents. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Adoption of Robert's Rules of Order. I would entertain a motion to accept Robert's Rules of Order as the order of business for our annual meeting. There's a motion, is there a second? And a second. Um, if, Christina, did you catch those? Do I you want to? Okay. I did, thank you. Because otherwise, if you want to raise your hands, that might help too. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve Robert's Rules of Order as the order of business for the annual meeting. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried. Election of annual meeting parliamentarian. Again, any district resident can serve as the, as the parliamentarian for the 2013 annual meeting. I would open up for nominations. I will note that Mr. Dunlap has served in that role in the past. I would nominate Mr. Dunlap. Well, thank you so much. Is there a second? second? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations for parliamentarian? Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I would um, ask all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, those opposed, <coughs> nay. Motion has passed. Mr. Dunlap is our parliamentarian. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been published and submitted to the media and in the appropriate places. I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. I so move. Is there a second? Second. Discussion, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Approval of minutes. I would note that in your packet, um, there is a copy of the agenda from the August 27th, 2012 annual meeting. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of the August 27th, 2012 meeting as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the annual meeting relative to any item at this time? If you would like to, we just ask that you come forward and share your name, address, and topic of discussion. I don't see anyone rushing to the microphone, so we will move on. Reports, district administrator's <clears throat> report will be the first report this evening. <clears throat> Thank you and good evening. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Let me begin by saying those of you who were just in attendance at the budget hearing, there are portions of my report <laughs> that will sound very familiar, but we do treat this as a separate uh, uh, meeting and so for the record and I'm going to share um, perhaps some repeated comments with the group <clears throat> the 2012-13 school year was one that brought a level of change to the school district that provided opportunities for both learning and growth new staff joined the district including administration teachers and support staff New families continued to move into our district. Professional collaboration, working to improve our instructional practices in order to maximize learning for students occurred. We also experienced changes that will have an impact on the district as we move forward, including being the second year that we just ended of the 2011-13 state biennial budget issues surrounding the state budget continued to present school districts across the state including us mm -hmm. with unique challenges as a result school districts had to make significant and in many cases historic changes to their budget development and our school board did make changes 
modifications to our process, which I think will serve us very well. <clears throat> Employee relations continue to be a priority. As 2012-13 served as the first year in which a common employee handbook was implemented in our district, which provides the guidelines and expectations for our employees. The employee relations team maintain a focus on providing feedback to handbook revisions during the course of the year, and, but also focused on issues important to working conditions for our employees. Change will continue to be with us as we enter the 2013-14 school year. However, change also provides us with opportunities to make a positive difference in the lives of our students. Exciting initiatives in the area of staff development will continue through our professional learning <coughs> communities. Developing our staff is critical to the improvement process that must continue in order to enhance the quality of education for our students. And student achievement remains our central focus of what we are all about as a school community. Work will continue with the Common Core State Standards and ongoing changes with student assessment and how we measure growth in student learning. A new evaluation system for teachers and administrators will be piloted in the district this year on a limited basis with full implementation mandated for 2014-15. <clears throat> This initiative in itself will cause teachers and principals to rethink the approach to evaluation as the intent of the model <coughs> is to focus on one's professional growth in order to improve teaching and learning. We continue to plan for the future as we live our vision of educating every student to achieve global success. <clears throat> Our strategic plan is driven by the belief that the school district is committed to continuous improvement at all levels of the organization in order to improve student learning. The plan assists the district with planning for the future, addressing performance goals and problems in a systematic way, focusing on results, enhancing decision making that impacts student learning, community involvement, staffing, facilities, and finances. Building community involvement and support for the school district initiatives as well. Within our four strategic objective areas, we continue to focus on specific goals that are measurable, attainable, results focused, and are time bound. The goals are intended to focus on specific areas in which the district believes it is important to improve in order to, to move towards our vision to live our mission. The mission of our school district describes our purpose and focuses directly on the service we provide our students. We must educate and inspire students today and prepare them for tomorrow by ensuring that all students learn at high levels as they de develop 21st century skills. So that our students have opportunities, we must continue to grow our partnerships with the entire community. And finally, we know that we must operate and act in a fiscally responsible manner while ensuring well-rounded educational experiences. <clears throat> our core values guide our behavior as an organization. We are committed to data-driven decision-making, focusing on results in student learning, continuous impro improvement, visionary leadership, and respectful behavior. Our four strategic objectives provide us with a framework of what we believe is most important in measuring our progress in meeting our vision and mission. Those four areas are student learning, where we provide a rigorous, relevant curriculum, high quality instruction to prepare all students for the future. Fiscal sustainability, where we provide and sustain the highest level of student learning in a fiscally responsible manner. Performance excellence, where we adopt and demonstrate a district-wide, systematic, research-based, and aligned approach to improvement. 
and communication where we communicate with students, parents, and staff, and community, utilizing accurate, meaningful, and timely methods. Within each strategic objective, the board has established SMART goals that help us assess our progress towards the objective. Within student learning are seven goals, focusing on student proficiency in reading and math. Wendy Cervaski actually reported out last May to the board on our progress. You will find this information in the annual report. The two goals here measure reading and math proficiency based on student performance on the WKCE for grades three through eight and grade 10. Here we have measures and targets for students and subgroups for reading and math as measured on the WKCE. These two goals assess performance of high school students by other measures since the WKCE is limited to only 10th graders. And finally, under student learning, this goal provides performance information on grades kindergarten through second grade, again, as another option uh, since the WKCE is not administered to those grade levels. I focused on this uh, during the budget hearing, uh, the fiscal sustainability area, and within that strategic objective area, we've identified one goal, but there are multiple measurements that go into this goal. This goal is unique as it puts academic performance measures together with per pupil spending measures as determined by the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance. The strategic objective area of performance excellence focuses on our improvement efforts and how we operate as an organization. Much of what we will be incorporating into a framework for improvement would be centered on the Baldridge Performance Excellence Program. Our history as a school district has been a commitment to continuous improvement as part of site-based decision-making and improvement model. While there will continue to be a place for continuous improvement efforts unique to our buildings and departments, this goal moves us forward in adopting and putting into practice a district-wide systematic and aligned approach to improvement. The board's most recent work with Mr. Matthew Fail, as well as the leadership team on August 8th and 9th is an important step in this journey. And we look forward to Mr. Fail's return in November. Finally, within the strategic objective area, of communication, this goal continues to be developed as we look at measures to determine our effectiveness in communication. We must identify areas in which to collect baseline information and data so that we can focus in on our gaps and our areas to address. <clears throat> I would encourage everyone to review the annual report as it identifies many of the highlights for you, including progress made in two of our four strategic objective areas, highlighting our student learning and our fiscal sustainability. And additional performance areas or measures used to measure our progress in the area of workforce, environment, and engagement, focusing on our employees. The annual report can be found on our district website. I believe we also have some of the paper copies available tonight. We know that school districts cannot do the important work of educating our youth without the support of so many. The support this community has provided students is exceptional. Thank you to the business community for supporting the students, parents, and teachers. Educating children is truly the greatest investment any community can make. The school district is here to assist parents in educating their children. It's critical that positive relationships are formed between parents and teachers. Parents are the first and most influential teachers of their children. Thank you to our parents and our school district for their support. 
The staff in this school district is committed to providing students with the best education possible. <coughs> staff at all levels go beyond expectations to make sure the services provided are of the highest quality. Thank you to our employees for what they do every single day. We also thank all who have been involved in helping home and students be successful. So many commit their time and energy to help students. Over the years, our district has benefited from hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteers sharing their talents and gifts with our students. In addition, community and school organizations, including our parent organizations, booster club, civic groups, community groups, Home and Area Foundation, and the list goes on, make significant contributions to our school district. I want to recognize and thank members of the Board of Education, your time, dedication, and commitment to providing our students a quality education while also representing the constituents of the community is greatly appreciated. You continually are faced with making difficult decisions that impact the school district, but you also enjoy the opportunity to celebrate the many opportunities you have, you have helped provide to make possible for our students. Your record as a board of providing visionary leadership, establishing policy, developing a budget that provides quality programming along with being fiscally responsible and holding employees accountable is to be commended. You continue to place students first in your decision making. Again, thanks to everyone who helped home and, to help our home and students achieve at the highest level. Looking forward, we will continue to focus efforts on continually improving instruction for students, beginning with the curriculum development process. We will continue efforts in assessing student results through, through various assessment methods in order to enhance our instructional strategies. We continue to examine data to make good decisions about what is needed to continue to move forward. Staff development continues to address building and program needs, attempting to tailor the program to the needs of the employee in order to have a positive impact on student learning. Working together and learning from each other is critical in order for our staff to make sure we are growing together as we live the same vision. Our work with professional learning com communities, or PLCs, will continue as we focus on that primary purpose of school, which is learning rather than teaching. Increased teacher collaboration efforts will be made in order to learn together best practices and what makes the greatest impact on student learning. Support services play a critical role in providing a quality education for our students and providing quality customer service for our students, employees, parents, and the members of our community. The school district is committed to the continual improvement for all our processes, systems, and resources. And again, I want to especially thank the Board of Education for your commitment to performance excellence. You've seen these before. We keep these out in front of us. In order to enhance the level of student learning, we must be able to respond to these four questions for school communities to consider. What is it we want all students to learn? How will we know if our students have learned it? What will we do if they don't know it? And how will we extend or enrich those that already do know it? Increased teacher collaboration efforts will continue in order to learn together best practices and what makes the greatest impact on student learning. There are opportunities I believe our district must address in the coming school year. Ensuring the success of every student remains our primary purpose, opportunity, and also <coughs> challenge. The 2013-14 budget includes the infusion of dollars into the area of technology. We need to get to the point where our students and teachers should have the available technology at their fingertips. But to make this happen requires us to change. 
Thank you to the board for directing more than $500,000 to technology for the second consecutive year. We are making progress, but we still have a long way to go. Additional funding has been allocated to other critical areas within the organization. The measures we have taken to respond to the budgetary challenges have been very difficult. We must continue to work on long-term solutions that will benefit student learning in our school district. We have a wonderful opportunity to learn and celebrate the many differences that exist throughout our school district. Even though our students are alike more than they are different, it is often those differences that can cause challenges for our students, staff, families, and community. Better understanding our unique gifts, our talents, our abilities, backgrounds, heritage, customs, beliefs will bring us closer together. The school district is grateful to our parents for the trust they place in our staff to partner with them in educating their children. Parent involvement is necessary in order to maximize student growth and potential. Parents are key partners in the education of our students and the school district must continue to provide meaningful opportunities to involve parents. So as we officially bring a close to the 12-13 and enter the 2013-14 school year, I look forward to working with this community as we live our vision and mission together. Perhaps the most challenging part is knowing how, how will we know we are achieving what we set out to do. Focusing on results is critical for us to move forward. <clears throat> this is a great school district with great people. Our students have a bright and hopeful future because of the collaborative efforts throughout our school district and community. So I thank everyone for your efforts and what you do to make a difference in the lives of our students. So with that, I do, I would be happy to entertain any questions. Otherwise, I am going to introduce Mr. Clark as we, I believe, for the facilities report. as we move into the facilities report, but any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark. We're going to find that report in just a minute. <laughs> well, sometimes it's the people, it's user uh, area. Yeah. That, 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 that IT training person. You good? Yeah, yeah, that's right. More mm -hmm. staff development for. <laughs> well, I feel after that long wait, this better really be good. I'm not sure I can deliver on that. So, this is the facilities report. This has been a part of our annual meeting for, well, many years now. I think maybe 10 years. Uh, not a mandatory part of the annual meeting, but something that in a growing school district has always been a point of interest. And so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, enrollment projections, um, the instructional capacity, uh, number of students each of our schools and grade levels is uh, designed to accommodate, um, how that fits into a long range facilities plan projecting the enrollment and then matching it up to the number of students we can uh, accommodate in each building leads to a long-range facility plan, how our debt or our financing lines up with the uh, facility plan, 
And then last year for the first time, and I think almost as a closure item, at least, uh, it's going to be on this year. Remember we talked last year about this deferred maintenance we had and how that fit into uh, facilities. So uh, on the enrollment projections, most recent year enrollment uh, has slowed. Um, and you'll look in a moment at a few of the most recent years and see maybe variability. It used to be that we had a really steady uh, 5, 10, and 15 years ago, almost 2% each year. You could almost count on it. It was within tenths of a percent. And there's um, slowed and greater variability in recent years. Um, a revision was made to the projection that we had been using for this upcoming year in July. Uh, that based upon some updates to enrollment that we were receiving at that point in time. And so we believe this is the most current and accurate projections available. So this uh, table uh, shows the school year, most recently completed five school years, and the district enrollment in those years, and then the year-on-year -year growth. It also shows on the far right-hand side that year-on-year -year growth without the public preschool. Um, we kind of keep track of that. Uh, with it in and with it, with, uh, with it being out of the percentage increase, it is the most difficult group to project. Um, when we have them here in 4K, we get a pretty good idea who's going to be here next year for kindergarten. Um, but the efforts have always come up a little bit short, coming up with a really reliable number. So um, we keep track of um, that group as a separate percentage. Note the variability in the report and the annual growth in column four ranging from a high of 3% to a low of 0.69%. Um, look at the last 20 years, as I mentioned, would reveal enrollment growth has averaged 2% per year over the last 20 years. So enrollment growth has slowed in this most recent years. Uh, the July revision uh, anticipated 12 uh, pardon me, 13-14 enrollment calls for a 1.56% increase. And applying that for the five years and leads to the forecasted numbers you sh see here, taking our 3,829 in 2012-13, this most recently completed year, and by 2017-18 would be up to 4,137 students enrolled in the district. Five-year increase of 308 students, or 8 percent. Now, this slide provides enrollment projections on a district level, all grades included, to evaluate the impact of enrollment on facilities. The enrollment projections need to be further broken down to the grade level configurations used by the district. Our grade configurations are preschool, preschool through fifth grade, what we call our elementary schools, 6 through 8 middle school and 9 through 12 high school. And um, this chart kind of flips things a little bit on its side, but uh, the chart breaks down the projected district enrollment numbers to show the enrollment for each of the grade level groups the school district of Holman has. Uh, note the 2017-18 district-wide enrollment still at 4,137 matches the value shown on the previous slide. Uh, in this table, you can look at how the district-wide enrollment numbers are distributed across grade level groups in the district. And so you can see our early childhood is broken out. Those are at our elementary schools. 4K um, program at community sites, 4K at elementary sites, the K through 5 enrollment at the elementary schools. Now this is the elementary including the 4K now. We bring those two numbers together. Middle school, Oak Grove where we have Academy on the Prairie, uh, high school, and then the district enrollment number. And again, that 1.4, uh, pardon me, 1.56% growth. So those are the enrollment projections. Well, what's the capacity of the schools to accommodate those? Uh, at the elementary, we currently state that we have capacity of um, 2,220 
Uh, that's 600 students at Viking Elementary School as a capacity, and then 540 students at each of the three other elementary schools for a total of 2,220. Uh, high school, you'll remember a year ago, we did a detailed study to see if the current use of that facility had changed the capacity, design capacity to that building. Uh, 1,288 is the currently designated student capacity at the high school, with the middle school having a capacity of 920 students. Uh, we're planning in uh, upcoming years to uh, reevaluate based upon the current use at the middle school whether that design capacity has changed at all um, since the remodeling was done at that school. So if we take the <laughs> enrollment numbers and now we overlay them on the facility capacities at elementary, middle, and high school, uh, we get something like this. And what this tells us, that pink with red, is uh, the year in which the middle school enrollment is projected to exceed the middle school capacity. And that's in 2019-20. And as I mentioned, for elementary schools, it's 2,220, and it does not exceed that number in the window of time shown here. Uh, and the high school, 1,288, and that does not reach either. Although if we extend those projections out further, you can see uh, the high school in 2025-26 uh, would exceed the currently identified design capacity. And uh, elementary school is out beyond that. Remember these illustrations? We put these together some time ago, and that uh, line that runs across the sheet of paper shows uh, enrollment growth over time, and then the dash lines dropping down show when facilities would be constructed. This first one uh, doesn't match up with what I just shared. That's because it's an old one. What I'm trying to do here is illustrate how, how steep that line is determines how soon we'll need to build facilities. So three years ago, we were projecting 1.85% enrollment growth. And uh, enrollment projections at that time called for facility additions to the middle school in 2015 and the high school in 2018-19. Uh, this chart also illustrated the facility additions that had taken place in recent years. Note the middle school in 2006-07 and Prairie View Elementary School in 2009-10. Uh, there were no other elementaries forecasted at that time either. A year later, the chart looked like this. Two years ago, the Long Range Facility Plan chart um, showed middle school addition pushed out by one year from the previous chart that I show uh, out to 2016-17. And the addition to the high school at that time was still at 2018-19. And then one year ago, three years, two years now, one year ago, the Long Range Facility Plan look like this. Uh, you notice the enrollment projections at the time placed the middle school addition at 2018-19. Uh, this is two years later than what had been forecasted a year prior. Uh, and the addition to the high school was removed from the chart because it was projected out beyond the timeline of the chart. And this would be this year's. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that line keeps flattening, and as it keeps flattening, it just keeps pushing out further to the right in time uh, when the new facilities would be called for based upon enrollment and capacity. So this is one year later uh, than the previous forecast. May I ask a question, Mr. Clark? Yes. The um, enrollment capacity, and I always remember it because we've built more elementaries than anything, um, the number that you have for capacity for elementary is, you've got the elementaries there at 540. Correct. And, but if you multiply that by four, that's a different number than what you had shown us as the capacity. Right. Viking. It's because you multiply it by three, and then for Viking, and then Viking. you add 600. Okay. So it's 540 times 3 plus 600. Okay, thank 2, you. 2,220. So that hasn't changed. Has the high school capacity changed, though? I think the high school changed. capacity, uh, as originally um, <coughs> designed and contained in the 
uh, literature when the 500 wing edition was put on um, was 1200 and the study that the uh, buildings and grounds facility committee did mr. Benashik was on that committee and I can't remember who all on the school board was on that um, actually adjusted that to 1288 increased it by 88 students when we looked at um, the functionality of spaces and how they were being used so in fact that's a significant reason when Jay moved to this graph here by the high school because this is the first graph that that changed where the high school is the high there. school okay right and that Let's see here. did the middle school capacity change also no okay <laughs> yeah you can see that from this example if the 1200 had remained in play mm -hmm. it would have been 21 22 that that would have turned pink mr panashik she's getting like we're going to get you a Thank microphone you. Just like to make a quick comment on that because I sat through all of that and felt really good about uh, uh, analyzing where we were actually at compared to what where we thought we were at. And the reality was that when you spend some time and you talk to all the participants, we found that we had better, we had more facility uh, and didn't need to spend money right away to change that. But with middle school, I don't believe we've done what we did in the high school. So there may be, uh, once that analysis is done, which was I think was a real compliment to the people that actually went out and did it and got the instructional staff and teaching assistants, everyone else involved, to determine what are the real needs that we found that uh, you know we can take a look at this and be smarter about it. And that is really what happened, I think. And I felt personally very good about it that um, if I could, anyone can contribute, I can a little bit, and uh, and I think we really made some good inroads there. Thank you, and thank you for your service. That's good to hear. And as a follow-up to Mr. Benashik's comments, um, while we did find that the capacity was larger than we had previously thought. We also uncovered some other problems, and uh, Mr. Bernashek's nodding his head now, and um, so there were um, common spaces um, that we identified as uh, barely meeting the current enrollment needs at the school, and saw some real problems that could be occurring uh, in flow through the building and accommodating uh, students' needs outside of just the classroom. Um, hallways and intersection points uh, that do need attention um, but in terms of the instructional space which was the primary focus we also had people say well what about the extracurricular programs isn't that part of the school day and the study did not examine that mm -hmm. it really was focusing on the on the school day Thank you. so uh, excellent point thank you for bringing that up because the uh, high school didn't just get pushed far to the right based upon enrollment it was also recalibrated based upon capacity so thank you for that uh, point now just because the chart shows that we would uh, look at a facility in 2019 20 at the middle school doesn't mean you can wait till the summer of 2019 to get started in fact uh, the construction timeline generally re uh, uh, referenced is about 36 months and um, five months of that would be, well, you can see here uh, the list of activities um, that have to take place. Uh, if you count that backwards from that 2019, it actually would be November of 2016, where we really would need to begin the pre-planning related to a referendum. That's not right away, but that's not too far off. When you're 14, 16 seems like a long ways away. But. <laughs> it does. Okay, and then I uh, promised to talk about uh, debt and how we uh, manage our long-range facilities debt relative to our facility needs. You've seen this before. This has not changed. 
This represents the mill rate associated with our uh, debt, the money we're raising, tax levy, money we're raising to pay off the bonds that we took to construct schools. Uh, the gray line on top is that $2.15 mill rate, and those who have been around on the board for a long time know that that was a, a ceiling uh, that the board at that time said, we're going to do everything we can to avoid going above. And uh, we're performing well below that in terms of our debt service uh, tax levy. You can see it declines over time, as you'd expect, that as we pay off uh, the money we've borrowed on facilities, um, the tax rate drops accordingly. You notice, too, that in, is that 2017? It plunges there for a year. And uh, that's intentional, because we had, uh, for some time now, been planning that in 2017, we're probably going to be needing to do some new construction and probably taking on new debt. So you would strategically plan to have debt drop off at the very time you thought you needed new debt because then it fills in like this. And uh, I talked in the budget hearing about making sure we have a tax rate that doesn't show wild swings up and down. People don't respond well to that. They like more steady as you go. And so um, this is the long-range plan we have. Mm -hmm. As the construction date continues to get pushed out, this is going to be a little bit of a challenge for us because rather than this drop happening in 2017, based upon the next edition being the middle school and not occurring until 2019, where might we more like to see that drop? We probably, if I can get that arrow back up there, would like to see that drop happen about here. And so we need to be thoughtful about this as we go into future budget years and ask ourselves, should we, in effect, be levying for this debt way out here in the future, pre-levying for it, they call that debt defeasance, to fill in this gap. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to drop here in 2017, ride out two years where everybody will forget about the tax drop, and then you're going to bring it up here at the same time you're trying to advance a referendum. Because people won't remember two years ago, they'll remember the most recent year. And um, so we're going to give some, have to give thoughtful consideration to that as we move forward on uh, future budget development. Uh, capital maintenance, um, quickly, uh, this past year the facility committee uh, studied uh, district facilities. Um, and the funding being directed to maintain district facilities in comparison to the needs of those facilities. Um, the study was initiated based upon concerns that the district facilities and sites um, must always remain ready to meet the needs of students and staff, uh, and that requires proper maintenance. There's a stewardship obligation that the school board and administration, and I think all staff members feel to district taxpayers who've entrusted them uh, with the facilities that we occupy. And one other thing that initiated the study was the adverse impact deferred maintenance will have upon future fiscal sustainability. Uh, fiscal sustainability concern stems from studies that show for every dollar of preventative maintenance missed, you'll ultimately spend $4 on deferred maintenance and repair. And simply stated, if we don't have $1 to put towards maintenance today, how will we come up with $4 needed to accomplish the same thing tomorrow? And so those were the driving forces. Uh, at the conclusion of the study, the committee came to realize that the $160,000 that was currently budgeted, budgeted at that time, for capital maintenance was insufficient to fund the existing capital maintenance needs we had in fact fell short by approximately two hundred and fifty thousand dollars uh, this was presented to the board uh, and along with six most viable solutions you see those listed here and in july of 2013 administration advanced to the board as a part of the 1314 budget recommendation uh, an annual maintenance budget increase of $170,000. The board did approve that, and that was included in the proposed budget presented uh, tonight. And so that filled much of the shortfall identified in uh, budget 
uh, for capital maintenance. What do we got to add to that? That would conclude the facilities report unless there are questions. Are there any questions? Mike. Now this is maybe something I should know and maybe all of you know, but <coughs> the proposed enhancement for a community center, uh, does that fit into any of this at all yet? Or is it still in a preliminary stage and, uh, and definitely would affect utilization of the high school depending on what's done? Based, I'll, I'll give a shot here. Based on the presentation um, that for tonight, uh, that's not recognized or included in any part of this planning. has been made it's still in the uh, calculating and, and uh, thought process is that it I think it would be fair to say no final decisions uh, have been made absolutely and I think um, it was reported earlier at the board meeting again by Mrs. Hancock Mr. Clark just ongoing work by the committee but again no I nothing final at all any other questions is the total debt right now oh um, you're playing right into our hand uh, mr. Brown because that's uh, during the next part of the uh, budget presentation but I'm gonna I'm gonna get you to it right now so if you go to page three of the buff colored budget that proposed budget the board has uh, approved and go to line 100 and that will give you the total debt that the district has at the end of each of the corresponding fiscal years. So for those who aren't able to look at this because they're at home, it's uh, the current indebtedness of the district is $24,658,000. Oh, pardon me, that's what it will be at the end of 1314. Is that the number you're referring to, Mr. Burrow? Yeah, yeah, I didn't that. Well, I... This is like when you buy your house and uh, you know I I say I own a home I the bank owns most of the home um, but I don't know if that's being in the hole or if that's having a place to raise your family and it's kind of the same thing with a school um, that the kids are here and we need to provide them a place but that's not a it's a debt we have an obligation to pay off but what are we paying on it each year well you can look at the difference from one year to the next and that kind of gives you a flavor for the rate that we're reducing it. You see that it was 29 million two years ago, and at the end of this last year, 27, then 24 and a half, about. I'm using round numbers there. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, then we'll move on to the treasures and report and audit summary. All right, we're going to try to make this transition a little smoother this time. Our esteemed parliamentarian and treasurer, Mr. Dunlap, will <coughs> assist with the presentation. Want to get up and stretch and move around a little bit? I <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this uh, a lot of the information you're going to be seeing is going to be repetitive from the previous meeting. Um, my name is Gary Dunlap. I'm currently serving as the board treasurer. I'd like to thank everyone who worked so hard on this budget. I think it's a really a good budget. Uh, the staff was a big part of it. Uh, administration, the school board, everyone did really well. And as usual, it looked like gloom and doom when we started. And it ended up being a very favorable, favorable uh, budget. So uh, congratulations to everyone. I'm always amazed that when the, when the budget all comes together to, at the end, it, it always kind of amazes me. I work with numbers all day long as, a, as an engineer. So uh, doing this report, I'm looking forward to it like, uh, like a mailman would be looking forward to going for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna get through, we're gonna get through this. Um, <coughs> I know you're all sitting on the edge of your seats, so we'll start. <clears throat> 
per state statute uh, 120.11 report is to, re to be presented at the annual meeting that states all receipts and expenditures of the school district since the last annual meeting, states the current cash balance of the school district, states the amount of the deficit, identifies bills payable of the school district, identifies the amount necessary to be raised by taxation for the support of the schools of the school district for the ensuing year. Also identifies the amount required to pay the interest and principal of any debt due during the ensuing year and provides a budget summary required under statute 65.90. Receipts and expenditures of the school district since the last annual meeting are presented in the 2013-14 proposed budget summary document. For those in attendance, this document is available at the table in the back of the room. For those viewing at home, the document is available on the School District of Holman website under the district tab and then the business slash financial services button. Column C of the document displays the unaudited actual numbers for 2012-13. The numbers shown in this table come from column C. The numbers in column C have been through a preliminary review by the auditor. However, the numbers are subject to change in the final audit. The total revenues of all funds represents the sum of revenue for each fund less transfers made between funds. This table lists the total revenues for each fund as presented in the 2013-14 proposed budget summary. For each example, Total general fund revenues are found on page 2, line 57. The number in column C is 40,515,914 billion, 40 million $40,515,914.70. You can find the total revenue for each of the funds in column C on the line listed in the table. The sum of the individual fund totals is reduced by the interfund transfer amount found on line 76. This reduction is necessary to avoid overstating the total district revenue. Interfund transfers represent the redistribution of revenue between funds. In 2012-13, revenue originally received in the general fund was transferred to the special projects fund to cover special needs students' expenses. On the bottom line of this table, you will see the amount of $49,937,000 six dollars and seventeen cents this is the num this number represents the total receipts of the school district since the last annual meeting <coughs> this table lists the total expenditures for each fund as presented in the 2013-14 proposed budget summary for example total general fund expenditures are found on page 2 line 80 the number in column c is $40,110,873.95. You can find total expenditures for each of the funds in column C on the line listed in this table. Excuse me. As with revenue, the sum of the individual fund totals is reduced by the interfund transfer amount found on line 76. This reduction is necessary to avoid overstating the total district expenditures. On the bottom line of this table, you will see the amount of $49,709,979.33. This, this number represents the total expenditures of the school district since the last annual meeting. The district's cash balance is $10,434,845 as of June 30, 2013. Six million four hundred and fifty six thousand nine hundred and fourteen of this amount is assigned to the operational general fund. Three million five hundred and eighty four thousand eight hundred and sixty eight dollars is assigned to meet the future debt obligation associated with the building projects and three hundred and ninety three thousand sixty three dollars held by the district for use as designated by groups and individuals receiving revenues to gift accounts. If you're looking for that in the buff colored sheet you won't find it the buff colored sheets deal with the district's revenues and expenditures the numbers that <coughs> mr. Dunlop is referring to actually come from the uh, audit report a preliminary draft of the audit report those are balance sheet items that just aren't reported out there but he wants to include that because it's a statutory requirement that we share 
This chart illustrates the district's operational general fund cash balance at the end of each month throughout the course of the annual budget cycle. While the district's cash balance may, may be nearly $6,500,000 at the end of June, the cash balance is negative in November and May. Negative balances happen when the expenses of running the district come months before the revenue needed to fund the expenses. The fluctuations in cash throughout the budget cycle require that the district to seek other sources of cash to meet financial obligations on a timely basis. This past year, the district used a temporary borrowing from the debt service fund to meet its cash obligations. The cash was later returned to the debt service fund with interest. While the temporary borrowing from the debt service fund has been an effective means to avoid short-term borrowing from outside agencies, administration would like to preserve borrowing from outside agencies as another business option. For this reason, authorized of short-term borrowing appears later in the agenda. <clears throat> the cash balance is a single component of the district's fund balance amount. Fund balance provides a more complete picture of the district's financial position because it includes all financial assets and liabilities. The unaudited June 30th, 2013 general fund fund balance is now $9,677,504. You will, you will find this information on page one of the 2013-14 proposed budget summary. See line seven under the column C. The next chart looks more closely at June 30th cash balance and how it fluctuates during the annual budget cycle. The unaudited June 30th, 2012 fund balance of $9,272,463.42. This compares to unaudited 2012-13 general fund expenditures of $40,110,873.95. The size of the fund balance should be looked at it relative to the size of the expenditure budget. Our unaudited fund balance is 24.1% of our expenditures as of June 30th, 2013. The next chart illustrates the district's 10-year trend of fund balance as a percentage of expenditures. <coughs> this, chart, this chart appears on page 43 of the annual report booklet. The chart has not been updated to show the 24.1% value for 2012-13 yet. The district's fund balance as a percentage of expenditures has ranged between 15 and 23% over the past 10 years. Note that the two-year dip dip in 2007-2008 and 2008-2009. This was due to the one-time use of the fund balance to provide startup costs for the 4K program. Other than the two-year dip in 2007 and 2008 and 2008, 2009, the fund balance as a percentage of total expenditures has re remained close to the 20% mark. As of the most recent year end, the district projects a fund balance as a percentage of total expenditures of 24.1%, an increase over the 23.1% of the prior year. The 2011-2012 year end percent is greater than the 10-year average and within the board established current target range of 20.5 to 23.5%. The increase in fund balance is a result of additions in referendum levy into the sinking fund and realized expenses less than budgeted. The 10 year average including 2003 through 2012 fund balance as a percentage of the total expenditure has been approximately 19.3%. Data from the 2010-2011 is the most recently available with comparative data from Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance. <clears throat> a deficit occurs when more expenditures occur during the budget year than there are revenues taken in during the same budget year. The opposite of a deficit is a surplus. A budget surplus occurs when more revenue is taken in during the budget year than there are expenditures. There is a general fund surplus report for 2012-2013. Please look at page two, line 57 of the 2013-14 proposed budget summary document. Under column C, unaudited total revenues and other financial sources listed at $40,515,914.70. Line 80 lists unaudited total expenditures and other financial uses as $40,110,873.95. 
The difference between these, these two amounts of $405,040.75 and represents the unaudited 2013-14 general fund surplus. This is a 1% variance in budgeted expenditures. The 2012-13 total budget surplus includes both operational surplus and instructional deficit. The operational surplus equals $492,929.75 and is the net result of a favorable, favorable variance in special instruction substitute and aid costs, special instruction medical services and supply costs, and central services supplies and communication costs. The structural deficit equals $87,889 and is the net result of maintenance reserve funds, sinking funds, sources of $122,067 and uses of $29,956 and paying off the WRS unfunded liability of $180,000. The net surplus of $405,040.75 contributed to the 2012-13 increase in fund balance as a percentage of the expenditures. Please remember these values are based upon unaudited figures available in July. The audit adjustments may modify these values by non-material amounts. <coughs> The balance sheet in the auditor's report lists outstanding bills payable as of June 30, 2013 to total $2,637,445. These liabilities fall into the following categories, accounts payable to vendors, pay payroll payable to employees, benefits payable to employees, and amounts due to other funds. The district has current cash and receivable, receivable revenue to cover these bills. Later in the agenda, I will be presenting a recommended action on the tax levy for the 2013-14 school year. The current estimated tax levy amount of $15,614,584 was presented earlier this evening at the budget hearing. Finalized tax levy is pending further information that determines the maximum permitted levy amount. The district's debt at the end of 2012-13 budget year is $26,859,000. See line 100 on page 2 of the 2013-14 proposed budget summary. By state statute, district debt may not exceed 10% of the equalized value of the school district. The 2012 equalized value of the district is $1,309,281,000. 10% of the equalized value is $130,928,100. Leaving the district with a margin of, an, of indebtedness of $104,033,100, over $100 million. The 2013-14 proposed budget summary document summarizes the 2013-14 budget. See the far right-hand column, column D, labeled Budget 2013-14. Detailed information and changes in this budget compared to the prior year were presented earlier this evening at the budget hearing. Are there any questions on the budget summary document? Any questions? No questions, Gary. Excellent. <laughs> any questions? Yeah. <laughs> At this point in my presentation, we have met the statutory reporting requirements. The next three slides provide further information on the finance of the district and identify the fiscal performance objectives that have been established by the board. <coughs> the mill rate. The mill rate is the rate of school taxation. This chart can be found on page 41 of your annual report booklet. The mill rate represents the school property tax for each $1,000 of property value. The current projected mill, weight, mill rate for 2013-14 is $11.79. Last year, the mill rate was $11.40, as shown here. This chart illustrates school district mill rates from 2002-03 through 2012-13. The blue line represents the mill rate of the school district of Holman. The pink line represents the Mississippi Valley Conference School average. 
and the black with yellow line represents the statewide average. Holman's rate has traditionally been approximately $2 higher than the MVC and the state average. This difference is due to our enrollment growth and the school construction debt that comes from building facilities to meet enrollment needs. A second reason for the difference is the community has a relatively small tax base due to the lack of industrial commercial properties. The difference between Holman, the MVC schools, and the state average is not anticipated to change in the very near future. The board has set tax rate targets to control sudden fluctuations in the tax rate plus or minus 5% of our own 10-year average and to indicate the tax rate to the state average 20% of 10-year average difference between Holman and the state. At $11.79, the 2013-14 tax rate is predicted to fall within the state average target upper and lower limits. However, the $11.79 would likely exceed the upper target set to control fluctuations. <coughs> per pupil expenditures. This, this chart can be found on page 37 of your annual report. 2010-11 data is the most recent available from the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance. Comparative expenditures per pupil exclude the following expenditures. Transportation, capital, debt, and miscellaneous expenditures. At the time, the district's comparative per pupil expenditures were $10,429. Holman is shown in blue. This is 0.2% more than the Mississippi Valley Conference average of 10,412 and 1.8% less than the state average of 10,617. The board has set a comparative per pupil expenditures target to balance the needs of students with the limited resources the community has to fund educational opportunity. The target calls for comparative per pupil expenditure to remain within plus or minus 5% of the state average. The 2013-14 rate does fall within this target. The Moody rating, this chart can be found on page 45 of your annual report booklet. The most recent year report here is from 2013. The School District of Holman is at a modest level of financial stability as measured by Moody's rating of, of double A3. There are 10 rating categories. Holman is in the seventh highest category. You will notice an increase in all ratings in 2010. This reflects an overall adjustment to the standards used to rate all public schools as Moody's created a more universally applied rating system for schools and businesses alike. The district is slightly below the state average and the NBC average ratings. This would suggest that Holman has comparatively less financial stability. This position stems largely from the debt associated with facilities to accommodate enrollment growth, comparatively low equalized valuation, and an operating fund balance that has been above the state average. <clears throat> More complete information on the district's Moody rating and other measures of the district's financial statutes can be found in the annual report document. The board has set a Moody's investment rating target to sustain financial stability in the midst of economic hardship. The target calls for District Moody's investment rating to remain at or above the AA3 rating level. The district's current rating meets that target. <clears throat> All right, now we're going to uh, talk about the audit report that we just recently completed. On Monday, August 19, 2013, the auditor met with representatives of the school district to present the 2012-2013 independent financial audit. This audit report by Auditors Engelson and Associates Limited included a management discussion and analysis and a financial summary. The auditor presented and responded to questions on the financial statements and independent auditor's report for all district funds. The auditor also stated the final audit report will be included in unqualified opinion. An unqualified opinion, opinion is what the district strives for. This means the district financial statements fairly represent the financial position of the district and that the district properly applies the generally accepted accounting principles. The auditor noted no management letter issues as a result of the audit. The management discussion and analysis reports information on budget to actual variances. Variance information is provided when the actual values, may, values vary by either more than one half of one percent of the line item budget or more than one tenth of one percent of the total budget. All budget to actual variances were below these reporting thresholds. 
Copies of the report will be shared with board members at the first meeting in September and copies of the complete audit report will then be made available to the public on the school district website under the business financial services. Unless there are any questions, I would ask, I'd ask the electorate in attendance to consider the following resolution. Be it resolved that the treasurer's report and auditor summary be approved as presented. Is there a second? A second. The motion has been made and seconded to approve the treasurer's report and auditor's summary as a presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. New business. Salaries of school board members. Currently, school board members are paid $2,720 per year and $50 for each additional uh, posted special meeting. They're also paid $50 per diem rate. Um, I would entertain a motion regarding the salary for the school board members. Um, I would make a motion that it would just stay the same as it's been in the past. I'm fine with that. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to set the school board salary at $2,720 per year with $50 per special meeting and $50 per diem rate. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Re okay. Recommendation of tax levy for 2013-2014. Um, as Mr. Clark has presented in the past, we have um, the, what you have there is a suggested or a potential resolution or motion. Mr. Clark, did you have any other comments to make to that? Only to answer any questions if there are. So I would entertain a motion regarding the recommendation for the tax levy. It, you're so moving the resolution. Thank you. Is there a second? No, sir. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the resolution as presented, which is to give the authority to establish the tax levy up to the full amount allowed under the state imposed revenue limits as is necessary to the, dis to the school board. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Authorization for short-term borrowing. As was indicated in the report, the um, administration would like to keep the option for borrowing um, from external, external partners for $1 million for the 2013-2014 school year. Um, and there is a resolution there. I would entertain a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Okay, motion has been made and seconded that the school district of Holman is authorized to borrow up to $1 million for the 2013-2014 school year. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Disposal of tangible personal property. Um, many times during the school year, we have personal property that we need to uh, get rid of and it may not be any longer needed for school purposes. This allows the board to determine the process of disposal, which would in some way and often calls for competitive bids. I would entertain a motion. John, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded um, to authorize the disposal of tangible personal property as is outlined in the resolution. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Annual meeting date. Um, a suggestion has come forward to actually change the meeting date from August 25th to a later meeting um, date in September. So I would, again, the resolutions there are um, for your consideration, but I would entertain a motion regarding the annual meeting. I will make a motion to set the annual meeting date for September 22nd. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, and Dr. Carlson, would you maybe explain? <laughs> I think it, it was gonna be my question. For many of you, you know there's uh, been quite a history of having the annual meeting and budget hearing on the fourth Monday in August. Over the years, we have just feel that um, for a variety of reasons, <coughs> we can 
actually hold a budget hearing and annual meeting that would be provide even more timely in, um, information. Um, you you heard multiple times tonight, for example, unaudited uh, numbers and so on. Uh, we are just ending that audit, and so we, we seldom have time to put things together for tonight. So that would be a benefit. I also am just going to remind everybody that um, something's happening next week. Um, we, we actually start school, and so <laughs> that's this time of year, really, I think um, that should be all our focus on making sure we're doing everything for our staff and for our students so they can come back for to start the school year this would allow our community um, to not have to address this important evening um, when, when so many of us are so focused on that start of the school year there are some other reasons but those are some of the highlights for at least administratively and perhaps the board that I think would be advantageous to put this a little bit later and I've often noticed that other districts have theirs later in the year as well. So this would be very similar. So any other questions regarding this? Seeing none, a motion has been made and seconded to set the 2014 annual meeting date for September 22nd. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Discussion, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.